So we're hoping that tonight, since you've all been interviewed so many times now for these films, right? How sick of you? <laughs> How sick are all of you of talking about your films? Not at, Not all. at all. Never get sick of it. Good answer. <laughs> And since we probably have quite a few documentary filmmakers and other filmmakers in the audience, we're thinking maybe tonight we'll try to avoid the same old, same old yada, yada, yada no questions that you've been talking about. Answers. Gloves off. At all the film festivals. <laughs> and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll focus on the craft of documentary filmmaking because it's a really unique uh, form of filmmaking and a unique art form. And maybe tonight we'll start with Ramel. All right, that's uh, <laughs> unexpected. Because, well, <laughs> the reason is because I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, you are, the f to anyone else, you're the, f the only filmmaker on our panel with your first feature documentary, is that correct? Yes, yes. So you have to go first. It's my first, it's my first film. I mean, I made a music video when I was like 11, but <laughs> got buried really fast on well, the YouTube. You have and been how are your friends <clears throat> about the fact that you're nominated for an Oscar at a DGA award, and I dread to think how many other awards, and this is your very first film. How does that sit with all your friends? I think they're just really confused. Because <laughs> they're like, you made us laugh sometimes, and you were good at the basketball. But this is a whole new thing, you know? Well, Ramel is, a, is, a, is uh, an accomplished photographer and came to this project as a photographer and focused on imagery. And his approach to the film is very unique. And when I, you know, watching it, you get this sense of, uh, of, of time and of uh, place and of actually being and interacting with the characters as a viewer, you sort of get that feeling. Can you talk a little bit about the craft, the approach, the directorial approach? And participating rather than following, maybe. Yeah, those are really good questions. Um, yeah, I think, you know, I come from a photography background, which is a sort of, I started with photojournalism, um, which is sort of connected to you know, sort of going to a place and photographing it from your sensibility and then going back someplace and then showing what you captured. And that sort of being truth, um, which I agree that it is, but I, I found that when you look at communities that don't share the same cultural values per se or don't have the same sensibilities as those who are going to those places, um, the representation that they show is one that like doubles down on the reductive nature of photography. And so when I was making the film, I was really interested in like what happens if you make a film and you participate in the lives of those who you're interested in in, in filming. What happens if you um, you sort of you know film where you, where you would be anyway? When I when I like talk to young filmmakers, I'm like go make a film that that's part of your life kind of already, and that sort of allows you to um, I believe sort of shoot with without this sort of like meaning and capture, like there's this, that, that nature, that like colonial capture that you do with the, with the camera um, has had like pretty nefarious consequences as it relates to our understanding of what, you know, what's the, the potential of the, the folks in on the continent of Africa or in some of these other places. And so to like not follow them, but to participate to me was almost like a revolutionary thing because you don't, yeah, it's like you, the camera's almost oriented different, right? So it's like instead of shooting at Chai, I'm like shooting with Chai. And then Chai occasionally passes in front of the frame. Sorry to like yell at you. <laughs> but like, the, like she passes in front of the frame and then it goes forward. And like I'm just as interested in what I'm seeing and what we're experiencing as I am with depicting her life. And so with that, I think there's a, a slight shift in um, truth. We, we, as documentary filmmakers, often think of ourselves as observers, but I think that maybe is a little twist, is a little different for you. Yeah. It's a, per, you're a participant. Yeah, a participant. And, you know, for me, um, like the film is in Hell County, Alabama, which is part of the Black Belt, which is, you know, this big swath of land between, um, you know, Texas and Florida, where the majority of slave plantations were. And so um, after slavery ended, um, you know, there's, still rampant social issues. It's one of the sort of hotbeds across the country for, for disenfranchisement and for poverty. Um, and for me, being there and, and, and living, you realize that like people aren't, they're, they're not, pe they say like poverty is like what happens to them. It's not what they are. Like the people aren't poor. They're, they're impoverished because of other things. And so when you, th there's this thing, when, when folks tend to make films about the black community, um, specifically in, in urban settings and rural settings in which there's a lot of poverty, they focus on things that are um, 
almost totalizing or, or foreclosing the understanding of the person being something greater than the poverty. And so while I was there, I realized that you know this method of participating was a way to sort of foreground something way more cosmic and way more interesting and way more human and way more transcendental and connective and relational and interesting than um, poverty. But it's inherently connected. And so you, don't, I, you didn't have to focus on that for that to be the truth because we know where it is. We know of the people. Um, and when that happens, there's something quite interesting, I think. But you have to see the film. I don't know if you've seen it. That's the only way to tell. It sounds um, like I'm just making stuff up, but I swear it's, <laughs> I swear it's true. I, <laughs> um, I love the film. I loved all these films. And um, the, the, the aspect that really um, drew my love in this case was really the very unusual craft mm -hmm. and exquisite kind of unique approach and the sound and the cinematography. When I um, first saw it, I had to see it again on a big screen. I had to ask you, what camera was that? How did you do the sound? I mean, you're really doing some really novel uh, things craft-wise that I'd really love for you to talk about. Um, and it's not, I think some of you have just extraordinary stories or character, you know, stories. I'm thinking um, free solo and through identical strangers. Um, you kind of have story of a lifetime in a sense. And then you sort of have these extraordinary characters with Morgan and um, RBG, not RBG, RGB. And, um, but I think in your case, uh, there, there is the babies, the baby dies mm -hmm. and there are, there are moments of life. But it's really um, your approach that, that makes the film, it's, it's all the, Craft. It's not you, you. Sort of. There's nothing sort of um, headliney that happens. It's sort of all in the making of it. And I was curious to talk to you about that. <laughs> yeah, I think that's there. There are so many things that were the impetus for the film. But what I'm gonna say as it relates to craft was I think the the way that I thought it sort of separated itself from the other ways in which um, the black community is typically represented. So you know. You realize when you know you you have a sister or you have a friend and something happens in their life and they tell you about it, like you understand it, but you can only understand it so much because you don't experience it, you know. And so one fundamental problem with uh, what it's like to live in a marginalized community or what it's like to be a person of color is that if you're not a person of color or not in a marginalized community, you don't experience it. And so there's this a disconnect. It's a conceptual thing, and you think you have the answers and you think you understand, but to have that anxiety, to have that visceral relationship to those things is what produces your identity, right? And so the film is trying to offer the experience of the black experience, whatever the black experience is. Um, the experience of looking through the eyes of a person of color, of myself, like the experience of participating in someone's life. And in that sense, it's, it's not about the story of their lives, it's about once again, participation, it's about being there. And when you do that, you, you really open up the documentary form and the use of the camera to be responsive to whatever's happening in front of it, right? You, you see something, you're like, oh, I'll just do a time lapse. Oh, that's an interesting leaf. I'll, I'll, I'll look at that leaf. And then in the editing room, I'll edit it in a way in which a person is sort of so enraptured by what's in front of them with the sound and with the sort of tools that um, cinema is so well, um, so wonderfully known for to kind of lull someone into this, this almost hypnotic thing. Um, and you know, it's not an experience of it, but it's, it's not a literal experience of being a person of color scene, but it's something that is a medium that is intentionally trying to reach for that connectivity. Are you making all this up? <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, well, I mean, I'd say like one third of it was factual. Okay, the rest good. was speculative, but speculative, spec we all speculate. So for, for Chai and Jimmy. When do we see clips, by the way? Uh, as we go. Oh. Or, or <laughs> I was curious. Did, did you want to see it? Well, we, we, we have to go in order. Yeah, yeah, we will. We'll, we'll get there. We're going to definitely, we'll show clips from every film um, as, as we go. But for, for, for Chai and for Jimmy, for the film Free Solo, how many people have seen, has anyone seen Free Solo? Okay. So you, you, you know what we're talking about here when we say that this is a film that is about observation, but ultimately did become also about participation in a very unique way. Um, they were actually ultimately in the film. The making of the film became part of the film and for a very good reason. Was that a tough decision? And you wanna talk a little bit about how that came about? So for those of you who don't know, Free Solo 
looks at Alex Honnold, who's the world's from, foremost free soloist, which means you climb with no ropes, and his like tenure dream of free soloing Yosemite's El Capitan, which is 3,000 feet, which, had never, which has never been done, which really had never been conceived of before Alex. Um, so yes, so the filmmaking becomes part of the film, and it was a really difficult decision for us because initially it just felt like it felt, we brought a very insider look to it anyway because you know, Jimmy and Alex have, have known each other for 20 years. Jimmy's a professional climber. You know, the vertical world is a world he's very comfortable in. Um, and it always felt like we'd be taking away from his story, from Alex's story, but there's, you know, at the heart of Free Solo is this kind of existential ethical question, which pertains to all of the films we make, which is that by observing or filming Alex, are, is he more likely to fall because we're a distraction? You know, kind of like the idea of the observer effect, and which kind of brings up then the question of like, why would we want to make this film? And it came down to that we really believed in Alex and that Alex is someone who has thought more about his own mortality than anyone else. I mean, he thinks about it every day, he's faced with it every day, and he chooses to live this life. He chooses to live a life of intention. And that inspired us, and it seemed it was it seemed like it was something we could we could take on. But in order to kind of foreground or like be authentic about the ethical question that we were debating every day that we lived with for two years, we had to include the filmmaking so that audiences could somehow like digest it along with us. But it is participatory. Like our film is very participatory. This is, it was Alex's best friends who were filming him. And it was a commit, I think the only way the film was possible was that everyone was committed, including Alex, that we were all carrying something together. Well, Alex had some legitimate concerns, it seemed, about being watched, you know, and does, that, does it change someone's actions? As, as documentarians, are we changing what happens because just by vir virtue of the fact that we're there with a the camera. Yeah. I think that was one of the most difficult parts of, you know, producing and directing the film was just, you know, we really had to think about how to insulate Alex as much as possible from the pressures of production. And, you know, the last thing we ever wanted was him to do something that he wouldn't normally do because we were there. And, you know, we wouldn't have even embarked on this film if we thought that that would be the case. And I, I had a, the great fortune of working with him and climbing with him around the world for 10 years, so I really knew his decision-making process, and I really had to trust that he would make, uh, you know, good decisions. And, you know, the other part of it was not just to insulate him from the pressures of pr the production, but also, you know, because I'm a professional climber and a lot of the people on the high angle team are professional climbers. You know, we've worked on both sides of the lens. We understand what it feels like when a camera's introduced to a situation. And so one of the big directives for ourselves, guidelines that we set for ourselves and the team was that not only do you have to protect him and insulate him from the pressures of production, but you really wanted to focus on him like preserving his experience as a climber because the whole point was, you know, this experience that he has it's deeply meaningful and gives him purpose and uh, we understand what that feels like so in that way it's very much like that participatory you know we we know what that experience is like and I just have to say I mean most people have these preconceived notions of what it's like for adventurers or climbers or explorers they assume that it's just you know, they're daredevils and they're not very you know the risk takers yes they're risk takers but they're also highly calculated and they do it for a reason. And that's always, I feel like, lost in a lot of people. And I wanted, I think we really wanted to share that experience with people. Um, I'd love to ask a little bit more about your collaboration and your journey as a team. I had the um, thrill of being in the audience for the first cut of Meru at the Mountain Film Festival. And it took my breath away at the time. And that film came away since then, and you two have come away since then. So I was curious about um, how you collaborate and how your journey has been to get to this They're high both point. smiling. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's just, I mean, yes, it is, it is love. Um, so, I, um, so Free Solo is, like, I think, my sixth feature documentary. And Jimmy and I met while making our previous film called Meru. I don't know how many people have seen it, but it's, 
it's it's like it's a very special film to us. It's based, it's Jimmy's personal story along with his two closest friends, Conrad Anker and Renan Ozturk. And we had met at a kind of conference, and Jimmy heard I was a documentary filmmaker and sent me kind of a like a selection of scenes, like kind of a, like a rough assembly. Um, and when I saw it, it just blew my mind. I mean, here was this vision of this connection to the world around us that was extraordinary, and also the images just blew my mind, and the characters, like these guys were all, like just, they brought, they brought it. Um, little did I realize that we would, you know, I guess fall in love in this process. And, you know, I was helping at first, and then it became about trying to help the man I love express his personal story in the best way possible. Um, and <laughs> That's amazing. You know, I mean, it's a pretty romantic story. It's a romantic story. Um, for those around us, it may not be as romantic because they're like they're a pain in the butt. Like you know, like they fight all the time, they bicker. Um, but here we are, two films later, and two children later. Um, with Meru, we had our first child. With Free Solo, we had our second. Um, and I mean, it's a it's a Free Solo in a way is like this extension. It's like the kind of the perfect manifestation of like our partnership or our marriage, in that it took. It really brings out like both of our strengths. Like no one in the world could could direct that vertical, what happened in the vertical space the way Jimmy could, and also bring this just really deep respect um, of Alex and what he wants it from life, and also like the pretty intense risk management. Like you know, the thing about Jimmy and I is we trust each other absolutely, and that makes a shorthand that's pretty pretty good. It, it's not necessarily in the mornings when he can't find his socks or something like that. This can be really really annoying. Um, and I'm sure I have my moments too, my dear. Um, but um, so he's really good. He's really Another good. Another smile. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm well trained. <laughs> uh, we, we'll come back. Yeah. We'll come back. Maybe. Um, <laughs> let's talk about Mr. Rogers, shall we? Um, has anyone seen uh, Won't You Be My Neighbor? Okay, good. So, so glad. It's a it's a different film, different filmmaking process than both Ross and uh, and and Jimmy and Chai, um, in that the character of your film is no longer with us, and you relied on a lot of uh, archival footage and some new interviews. So it's a it's a different type of filmmaking process. What was your original directorial vision and approach when you came to the story? Well, um, yeah, it's. It, no shocker that Fred Rogers is no longer here. You know, and I knew that. I wasn't going a spoil in. wasn't a spoiler, okay. was it? I'm sorry. Okay. Um, you know, really, and I've done a lot of archive docs, and I love archival docs. Um, but this was really me accidentally rediscovering Mr. Rogers as an adult, and finding him to be one of the most radical people. I had ever come across. I mean, radical in what the root of the word means, you know, really fundamentally altering how we see the world. And I loved him as a kid, and I didn't know any of this. Nobody knew any of this. But as I was reintroduced to him as an adult, every time I saw him, there was something about him that moved me, you know, um, just profoundly. Um, I mean, what it was was I was... I was craving that voice, and it wasn't that I was craving Mr. Rogers from my childhood. I was craving a voice in our culture that was speaking to the things that I felt needed to be addressed. I mean, this was 100% about making a film about today. It's kind of an anti-nostalgia film, strangely enough. Um, and it was really me, I mean, it's an issue I've come back to many times in different films, this idea of kind of common ground, of uh, media's role and culpability and how we've built our society and divided our society. Uh, where are the grown-ups in our culture anymore? I mean, all these kinds of questions that I keep coming back to. And there, in the unlikeliest of places, Mr. Rogers happened to be this vehicle that I just... Um, I mean, I thought it was crazy at first when, when I kind of proposed the idea, you know, and people be like, oh, is Captain Kangaroo next? You know, yeah. <laughs> the Romper Room trilogy, you know, and the, um... but, you know, because in a way, Mr. Rogers has been a punchline for 30 years. You know, I, I can show you the dozens of headlines that are, you know, making fun of Mr. Rogers. You know, culturally, he's been a punchline. Not anymore. Thank yeah. You. Thanks to you. Well, that's the thing is, I mean, I felt like 
um, as I got into it, and all of us who make films know, when you're in a situation where things are going right, where like, we've all been in, you know, many of us who make films have been in situations where it's like pushing a rock up a hill, and this was the opposite. It was like, it just kept getting better and better and richer and surprising. And it was one of these experiences that, I mean, I'm not exaggerating to say, if nobody ever saw the film, I would have gotten everything I needed out of the film. Like, it was, for me, hands down the most fulfilling, personally changing experience of my life, professionally. And you did have uh, quite a bit of footage to draw from. Yes, there's no it's shortage of footage. well documented man, yes. Um, you know, he did 913 shows and, um, you know, other series and every lecture. I mean, there was a wealth of material, which is incredible, you know, when you're doing an archive project, you know, you live or die by your archive. Um, but in a way, the thing I did differently this time was I went in not trying to do what people often do in an archive doc, which is you take your 5,000 hours and you cut it to 500 hours and you cut that to 50 hours and you cut that to a six hour cut and a three hour cut. And I, I didn't have the patience <laughs> for that. I mean, we went through the footage, but, but also in, ha and I've done docs like that before, but I feel like you lose your intentionality. Like, it's so easy to be seduced by the archive and lose focus of what you actually wanted to say. So what I did at the beginning was I made a list of points I wanted to make or ideas I wanted to explore or kind of what, what became scenes. And I came up with a list of about 35 of them. And in the beginning, in the edit bay, I said, let's just cut these 35 ideas. And we put them together and we had 100 minutes. <laughs> And it was pretty good. <laughs> and I was like, OK, now any new thing has to knock out something else. And we lost scenes, and we added scenes, and we worked on it for a lot longer. But it was this idea of not being distracted and really focusing on what do we want to say. Because fundamentally, the film is not a biography. It's a story about ideas. And just remembering that and not being distracted. I mean, whenever we would cut out some big biographical beat or some bit of exposition, it felt like a victory. You know, that, that exposition is the enemy. <laughs> we will get to Tim, Betsy, and Julie. But the, <laughs> before we get there, let's just take a look at a clip from Won't You Be My Neighbor. All right. So, um, so much to talk about, and we'll circle back to the clips. Um, I want to take a second to say, um, wow, Box Office 2018 documentary. We have um, uh, not you, Ramel, but everyone $2, else. Two thousand dollars. Yeah, lunch money. <laughs> and how fantastic that you're here. And um, and uh, for you other four teams, how fantastic that you raked it in at the box office in record-breaking fashion, which. Um, has been pretty exciting and um and uh with um extraordinary um important films and i think we're going to go back and link to archival question of um or or um uh i, I think uh, the suggestion was to talk about archival uh should we talk about archival use of archival material um uh, uh both three identical strangers and ruth bader ginsburg have a quite extensive archival. It's true, and um, uh, and an extraordinarily important uh, character and an, ex an extraordinary, um, fascinating story. And also say congrats on your second Oscar nomination for the song. Do you do you sing it at all? I'll fight. <laughs> Not here. Not no. here. In the, a little bit celebrating in the bath, etc. Um, uh, should we start with uh, R B G? and um, how you use the archive and how you balance that out with the different kinds of material. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think the first big decision on our part archivally is that some of the, probably the very strongest archive uh, in our film is audio, uh, not pictures, because Supreme Court arguments are audio taped and have been for, for decades now there are no video cameras in the Supreme Court. Um, 
Ruth Bader Ginsburg, you know, our, our film is so heavily steeped, you know, not on the current day notorious RBG, uh, who's become an internet sensation and without whom I'm quite sure we would not have gotten funding to do our film. So God bless the current day internet fame of the notorious RBG. But we really wanted to tell the story of uh, that's l less known and equally uh, probably more important of the role that she played as a young lawyer uh, securing equal rights for, for women under the Constitution. Um, her arguments before the Supreme Court when she was a lawyer are important and so powerful to listen to that even when we kind of cut, cut together like a highlights reel in, in seeking uh, to get funds to move our film forward, like even, even with nothing, even with just like a black screen, hearing her voice saying these incredibly, you know, moving to listen to, kind of cutting through a lot uh, words and with a level of intensity and power that, um, you know, for a, a young woman lawyer arguing before nine male justices, like you could just feel her nervousness shifting to knowledge of her own strength as you hear her voice. So we said, you know, like, let's not be scared of the fact. I, I feel I feel like we said, we're saying that in, you know, you know, you say things when you're pitching stuff and like you're thinking, like, we'll make that true later. Um, I, I remember, <laughs> yes, good, you do, you do know that. Um, I, I remember thinking as we're saying like, oh, it doesn't matter that there's no pictures. The audio is so powerful that like, we'll just somehow, you know, and. Um, it was but, though. But, it's very effective to show the, the courtroom where it all took place. In my head now, thinking back, until you just said it and reminded us that it was audio, in my head I kind of thought it was I was seeing the whole thing in memory. She has a powerful voice. I mean, I think the other thing about our approach to using archive and to telling the story in general was to really make uh, the Ruth Bader, not shy away from Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the 83 or the 84-year-old woman uh, early on in the film, not to make it a traditional biopic and to find ways to go back and forth in time because she obviously um, is a fascinating person and she plays a very important role in our society today and we really wanted to find those devices that we could go back and forth in time. So one of the things was uh, the discovery of our editor Carla Gutierrez, or the suggestion when she was looking at the archives, she looked at the the four hour, the uh, four days of the Senate confirmation hearings when uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Judge Ginsburg, was being considered for the Supreme Court, and you know it goes on and on and on. However, there are some amazing moments where she's really. Um, presenting her life, you know, she is telling her story. And it was Carla's idea that we could go back and forth in time from excerpts from the Senate confirmation hearing. That gave us a device to, to be able to weave uh, the current day uh, Justice Ginsburg and the scenes that we were able to film of her with, with the archive and with the story of how she got to be who she is and what she did. For those scenes you were able to film, I mean, can you direct? Ruth Bader Ginsburg? I mean, no. can, you, can you say it no. right now? <laughs> no. I imagine it's... Uh... And the Supreme Court, I don't know. Can you tell them what to do? Uh, 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 no. no. I mean, you know, this is a very regulated place with um, a lot of rules and procedures. The whole idea of a camera crew being there, making this film, maybe, I mean... Justice Ginsburg, uh, you know, was was after about a, a kind of a year and a half of persuasion was on board with the the project that we were doing. But um, you know, I think the court was somewhat uh, astonished was when somewhat they learned astonished and when we we had actually started doing a fair amount of filming before the sort of court was was you know m m we were filming her on trips that she was taking and public appearances that she was doing and but before um, before we started engaging with kind of the public relations um, apparatus. So when, when we were filming uh, in the court, um, there were often uh, a number of kind of austere, Ob not... <laughs> observers. <laughs> Obser <laughs> yes. ob observers. Uh, to, to the situation, so um, it was, uh, it, uh, I mean, there was a lot of, that was nerve-wracking about the whole Yeah, I mean, and they have very deliberate rules about what you can and cannot do. We did, um, you know, for example, 
there's a rule that you can't interview anyone other than a Supreme Court justice in the Supreme Court building, like a, a television interview. So, you know, Justice Ginsburg was, we didn't know about this rule. She was uh, talking to some young students and then she left the room and we thought we'd just go over and talk to the students and see their reaction to her because they seemed to be very impressed. No. We couldn't do that. L luckily yeah. for us, there you know they base everything on precedent, so there was no uh, no rule against showing clips of Saturday Night Live inside uh, yeah. the Supreme Court. Um, we did not as ask their permission to yeah. uh, show Justice Ginsburg the um, Kate McKinnon impersonations, which uh, she had never uh, seen of her, uh, which we had <laughs> learned from her her children that she had not previously. Uh, scene and luckily for us when we mentioned that in addition to interviewing her we wanted to bring a monitor into the court and show her clips of some parts of our film they didn't ask what is it exactly that you will be showing her so when we came to the part of the interview when that happened and just said you know to our associate producer operating you know could you just, just roll clip five and the SNL you know of Kate McKinnon like doing her dance started to play the whole like the 12 public relations people, there was like this hushed gasp as they were like, oh my God, what are they showing the justice? She leans forward, she's watching, she says, is this Saturday Night Live? Who's the actress playing me? And then she just, I mean, it's in the film. She, as soon as she burst out laughing, the whole, like the whole room kind of relaxed and then it was all gonna be okay. But there was, it was, a, you know. And was that part of your, um, stepping back, was that part of your, um, approach of trying to um, do a sort of not entirely kind of sober boring because you 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 we do we take these extremely serious subjects don't we and then we have to also sort of make an entertaining film at and sell millions of dollars of tickets congrats and you did it wow um, amazing um, but were you with the, with that things like that SNL thing? Were you thinking like, oh my gosh, we got to like get some movie magic thing, screen dynamite going, you know? Well, I, I'm not sure if we were thinking exactly that, but you know, Justice Ginsburg has a great sense of humor, and we felt that there, you know, there's a lot of funny aspects uh, to her life, including you know the the whole internet phenomenon, which is kind of unbelievable and um, is fun. And we really felt that um, it was appropriate to weave humor in a story that fundamentally was pretty serious about constitutional law and how a young lawyer did this you know, very radical thing of suggesting that men and women should be treated equally under the US Constitution. Oh my goodness, back in the early 70s, that was uh, not accepted. And to explain sort of the legal strategy, you know, that, that would be, that's kind of serious stuff. And then we would be able to uh, go to the love story often or, you know, another other moments from her life. I mean, in terms of directing her, I will say you, you can't direct Justice Ginsburg and she's so focused at whatever she does. You know, so when, I mean, you know, I've shot a lot of Barry Tay in my life and never with someone who is just so not paying attention to the producers, to the directors, to the camera people. She, for the scene in, um, you know, the the workout gym, she just came in there with her, you know, her uh, sweatshirt that said Super Diva, and um, you know, Bryant Johnson, her trainer, started telling her what to do, and she just did it. She didn't pay any attention to us. Well, following up a little bit on Can Lucy's... Can we just ask them quickly? Pick, oh, sorry. Can we've I just got, ask them? Okay. We've got to ask them. Come on, though. Come back. You, you made a lot of money with this film. And it is... <laughs> it's our, great. Our, our, our distributors our, made our a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just, 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 just to yeah. clarify. Our gloves are off. We love that <laughs> here. Yeah. Yes. Your lucky distributor. Were they um, expecting to... Now, what I, th I, what I think is wonderful and has really cheered me is I love that you made such a incredible important film and that it found an audience and I don't think for my mind anyway that it was an obvious I don't think you were doing it to make big money at the box office for your distributor um, were you surprised was were they surprised was anyone surprised did you get in a kind of like fun moment of saying big mistake to anyone um, who passed you up or uh, see was there any of that kind of like for you 
we didn't have the opportunity to say that, but yes, so yes, there were some yes, there were some in entities that turned down the uh, opportunity to be involved um, with this <laughs> film. When did CNN come in? CNN, CNN came in. About you know about sort of a you know fifteen months or something after we came up with the idea and 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 that Justice Ginsburg had sort of you know, given us a somewhat limited approval. They came in and they took a risk because at the time that they agreed to fund the project, we didn't have the kind of access that, that we wound up getting, but we sort of said to them, look, if we don't start shooting, we're never gonna get this access. And and they understood, um, you know, and I think, you know, Amy and Tellis, Courtney Sexton, two women, they really got it. The, the story appealed to them. They thought it would be a powerful story. They believed in it, and you know, I think they're happy that they said yes. OK, I was, what was that? There's a transition to Tim. Oh, that's what, it's yes. funny, because that's they what I was about yes. to say. <laughs> you can't watch CNN now without uh, every 30 seconds a promo for three identical strangers. <laughs> I, 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 there are people on Twitter complaining that it's really starting to annoy them now. I don't because I, in the UK we don't we haven't got it, so I don't. I don't but know it's what's wonderful. Going on. It's fantastic to, to to get that kind of promotion, and the yeah. film certainly deserves it. So congratulations yeah, on congrats. that. Thank you, thank you. I mean, I think look, the 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 filmmaking money is is interesting. I mean, like like these guys, I, I personally haven't profited at all out of it making money. But I think uh, the biggest surprise to me was just that Three Identical Strangers is not based around a a well-known person. It's not in any way a kind of pre-sold property or anything like that. People don't know what they're getting. It was just really word of mouth that, that got people to it, which was um, pretty extraordinary. I mean, we didn't even think we were going to get into Sundance, and it just the whole year has been a bit surreal, to be honest. It's such a great story. It's, it's a story of a lifetime. When did you realize um, that you had this incredible kind of story of a lifetime, and the nature you had the nature versus nurture, kind of incredible thematic sort of um, fascination, but you also had this unbelievable personal journey, and then you had this archival scientific trove, and secret, and revelation, and twist. You had it all. We're, we're not giving any spoilers, are we? I don't think so. I think that there's everyone, one knows, big one. everyone knows there's a spoiler that you don't want to get if you haven't seen the film, that there's a kind of twist, but I, I don't think we gave it away. Yeah, I mean, I'm sort of, I've, I've spent... 12 months trying not to give it away. I've sort of given up on that now. But, Wait, you, uh, mean, you mean uh, everybody in the film? I was just going <laughs> to, I was going to fake spoil it, sorry. Um, but um, no, look, it's, it was kind of a weird one for me because um, my background, I'm an observational director. Yeah, I, I, this is my first feature, but I, my background is really observational kind of verite guy. You know, previous film, I was in Europe's largest prison for convict, convicted murderers, just filming with a camera by myself for like nine months. That's more the kind of thing that I'm used to doing. So this was kind of, I was, I, I, I was in development at Raw, this company, uh, the, the UK production company that had made a documentary called The Imposter. And I'd specifically gone there to try and learn a bit more about this kind of past tense um, storytelling kind of style. And um, in that job, you know, I, and I've been head of development for documentaries for the BBC in, in London as well. Y y you see so many ideas and you just, you just get really blasé and you just say, oh, I've seen every idea. But the, a producer brought it, this idea in. It wasn't fully formed or anything, but instantly... I could kind of see that this was, you know, the best, probably the best documentary story I'd ever seen because of the layers you mentioned, because there's a great human interest story at its heart that we can all relate to about these brothers separated, reunited, separated again by the end of the film. And, but it also has these layers that enables you to explore kind of nature versus nurture, free will, destiny, all those kind of things. And the, I mean, the interesting thing about it is actually the story wasn't fully formed and it, because it's this kind of pre-internet era that it took place in, we, we didn't have that much. There was a, They had their 15 minutes of fame where they were reunited, and there was a bit of archive there, and there's a tiny bit later on when Lawrence Wright put a small chapter in a book he wrote about twins. But really, there wasn't much there. And now, you know, now you go online, there's a Wikipedia page, and there's so much about the story, and everyone's like, oh, yeah. And it was like, people think the story was fully formed, but actually, myself and, and the producers, you know, two producers working on the ground, I mean, spent four years trying to kind of piece the story together. It's a story that stretches over 60 years. There's three families. Um, uh, it, it was very, very complex. We ended up with a sort of timeline that was like, I think it's like 32 pages long. And, and just trying to piece all that together. And so the archive as well, I mean, the big, the big challenge with the archive was that, um, well, A, I wasn't used to working with it, and B, the key creative decision I made with the film was that I wanted to, I was really interested, I've always been interested in point of view, and I wanted to tell this from the point of view of the brothers and res restrict the audience's perspective 
to that of the brothers. So people, I, you know, some people say to me, oh, the editing, maybe it was a bit manipulative and things like that. Well, all, all we did was restrict the perspective so that everything, ev everything that was revealed to the brothers is revealed to the audience at the same time it was revealed to the, to, to the brothers. So you're sort of in their shoes. And that was, that was fine once they'd been reunited because there was a lot of archive. But before that, there isn't anything. And that's why we had to fall back on um, reconstruction, which personally, you know, I'm always quite agnostic about. But if I, once I'd made that decision that we were going to tell it from their perspective, I had to do that. You know, it was, really, it was really key. And I think, you know, as an observational filmmaker, the, the, the point of view is actually generally more kind of omniscient. Do we call it observational in this country or do we call it verite? I, well, well, the, the, technically, I, I think they're, slight, they're supposed to be slightly different terms between uh, verite and observational, because verite is more, you know, where you expose the, you know, the, the, the messes of production and things like that, and you kind of break the fourth wall and, and all that kind of thing. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think in observational filmmaking or verite filmmaking, the camera is sort of, it's, it's more of a kind of omniscient, there's less of a definitive point of view. Our point of view is kind of the camera's point of view. Whereas with this, it was like, okay, I'm going to restrict the knowledge that the audience has to everything, to just what the brothers had at that time. And that's why it feels like an emotional roller coaster because that's what they were going through as well, I think. It, 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 it works. You're here. We're celebrating you. <laughs> and, um, and your distributors uh, uh, think it works too. And uh, CNN can't stop boasting about how, how well it works. So I think it, it, we're here to celebrate how well all your beautiful films work. Is it time to watch a bit more, or what, what's our Well, what's we our started uh, with Ramel and talking about exactly what we're talking about mm. right now, the observational versus verite yeah. versus all of those good things. So why don't we take a look back where we started, at uh, a, a clip from uh, Ramel Ross's film, Hale County, this morning, this evening. All right. And then we'll talk some more. <laughs> Ramel, did you make the film that you set out to make? That's one of the best questions someone asked. People normally frame it differently. It gives me an out. Uh -huh. um, but I'm going to be honest with you here. Please. Um, well, I didn't. Not that I'm not honest. Obviously, we've been through that. Um, mm -hmm. No, the film, I, I didn't start out to like necessarily make a film. I started out filming you know, my friends in order to like do something with the footage, I didn't quite know what it was. And I knew it was gonna be a documentary and I, I made a cut really early on, um, five months in. So I shot for five years um, really early on and I was disappointed with the cut because the cut to me reflected um, a means of documentary that I thought wasn't necessarily gonna provide folks any new information as to what it was like to be them or what it was like to be me there or um, you know what the black experience is, uh, whatever that is. and so. I made some adjustments to the form five months in and then realized that you know you could make a document a documentary film is anything that's uh that someone calls a documentary um, um and then you know it's up to your personal sort of because documentary films are insanely edited you know there's like millions of people involved with all these like micro decisions and so truth is really fuzzy it's more about the personal integrity of the person um more than it is about i think uh some other concerns, and so I made some adjustments, and then this became the form. But I will say, which is more interesting, um, that the film, you know, I think about, you think about the way in which once music became part of, or instruments were introduced into the black community, you have these new forms of music, like jazz, you know? And like, we can't imagine America without jazz at this point. Um, there's, like, it's incredible now that it's a time in which cameras are being given to middle-class black folks that have time to make their own ideas and to participate in you know, meaning making for the United States. And so the film is sort of speaking to what it's like, what, what's the centrality of the, the black experience as it relates to film? What is it as it relates to documentary, documentary? How do I, how do we want our lives visualized? What do we believe meaning is within our community? Um, what, what moments can be used to characterize or to illustrate or to represent a person, you know? Um, most images, 99.9% .9 of all images of every black person have been made by white people, you know? Um, that's just been historical. It's not necessarily sinister. It's just the way history has played out. But now, um, in a time in which, you know, everyone has cameras and everyone has these different ways of representing themselves, um, things like this emerge that just are, um, you know, the sort of jazz of, fi of film in some sense. 
I think. Go ahead. Do we have to? I, I've lost track of where we are time wise. I don't know if we have to move on or if we can ask more questions. Oh, well, you can always ask more questions. <laughs> have a question? Uh, after you or? Oh, well, I, I just wanted to talk about, because the, the, the style of filmmaking, I mean, for, for, for Chai and for Jimmy, yeah. um, they also made a film which could have gone in a different direction. I mean, in a let's very hope not. bad way. But ultimately, let's, 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 without going there, did, did, back to the same t question I asked Ramel, is did you end up making the film that you set out to make? Or do things change along the way? Well, I think, I mean, that's kind of the beauty of nonfiction is that you just don't know what's going to happen next. And that's kind of the fact you live with, right? Um, we understood why we were interested in Alex. I mean, Alex is, a, is a, a very special character, like the way he handles his fear, this idea that like he, you know, he couldn't connect with people, but he learned and taught himself how to connect and how he just worked really, really hard to kind of pursue this dream. So we knew that, but we two things happened. One, when we approached Alex about the film, he said there's only one film to make, and that is if I try to free solo El Cap, which just changed the dimensions of the whole conversation. And, and me not being climber, I was like, that sounds amazing. Oh, that could be quite interesting. And then Jimmy was like, what are you talking about? Um, I said, so then we struggled with that for about six months. But then when the real thing we never could have anticipated is Sonny. Um, so in the film, he meets a woman. So he, he, when we began filming, he was online dating, um, which was just this, it, it was just like a, a point of comic relief in a film that was pretty scary. And we always thought like, yeah, it's gonna be pretty funny as like Alex sets up these dates at every city and he tries to explain what he does for a living and we're like, please don't wear your climbing clothes to your date. And like, are you gonna go visit him in his van? Like it just, it was this whole thing. Um, and then he meets this woman who is just, she's really special. She's incredibly emotionally intelligent. She is self-confident enough to push back on him and can say like, this makes me really uncomfortable, but I'm gonna try to love you for who you are. And that was a revelation for Alex. And so suddenly Alex and Sonny are falling in love in front of the camera. And then there are two mountains, right? It's like free soloing El Cap. And then also how, for someone who's so scared of intimacy, how is he gonna handle this? You know, not, like even mentioning that we're sitting there in the van with him. Like it's just, it's like even worse. Um, so they hadn't met when you started filming. No. So that was one yeah. potential change. And Jimmy, as someone who climbs yourself and is an adventurer yourself, um, did you have a conversation? Did you have to have a conversation with him about what you might do with the footage if it didn't end well? Yeah, I mean, we have fairly candid conversations about that. Uh, there was a, some of it on camera, but I'm wondering about off camera. Yeah, I mean, we, well, we had, Chai and I had to have those conversations before we even started, you know, pre-production or embarking on this, on this film. You know, we really had to think about all the potential outcomes, you know, if those were, you know, how we were going to deal with them. Uh, I mean, we had to be responsible filmmakers in that sense of going into it with our eyes wide open. But, you know, with the conversations I have with Alex uh, around, you know, how things were going to play out, you know, we certainly had conversations around, you know, he did ask me once, he's like, well, what happens if I decide not to do it? That was kind of one of the first conversations. And I was like, well, that's fine, because that's what the movie's about, you know. And, uh, but we did talk, I think, as climbers, the conversations come up more often than probably, maybe, I, I, I'm not sure, I only know my own experience, but you know, you do talk about your mortality. You do have friends that you lose over time and you know, we're relatively familiar with it. Uh, but Alex's view on life and death is, you know, played out in the film. He talks about it, you know, it's like, we are all gonna live and we're all gonna die at some point. And, uh, you know, how we were gonna handle that was always about, you know, being really respectful to our subject. And, you know, the film started out with the intention of talking about his legacy and why he was inspiring and how he faces his courage. And, you know, if the things that we thought about were always that most 
likely we thought he was either going to do it because he would never do it if he wasn't prepared or he would decide that after practicing for two years he wouldn't be able to do it and he just wouldn't do it. Uh, there are outcomes where there's things out of your control where you know he could have fallen and in that case you know we always talked about how we would you know move forward with the film and you know it wouldn't be a very pleasant experience but I think that we wanted to respect you know who he was and what he did. And I just think to that end I don't think the film would have said something different you know, and that's kind of the question, like, would we have made a film about how dangerous this is and, like, what a stupid idea it was? Like, I, the point was that it was always about honoring why he did it, you know, like this idea of, like, living your life to the fullest. So we would have had the terrible job of making a film with that fact, and we clearly didn't think that was going to happen or else he wouldn't have shown up. Um, but it wasn't necessarily a different film that would have been made. Well, so that for those of you who haven't seen the film, let's take a look at some of the footage. I think it's, I believe this is the opening of the film we're going to see. Free Solo. Incredible. And um, uh, I just think of all the different sort of shapes and challenges of your films. And... Um, that it, with Free Solo, it was such a singular story. Having made, what I've made a mountain film, my second film, Blind Sight, and um, I always use that analogy of like the narrative of, of a climb is such a fabulous sort of um, narrative, sort of singular narrative to sort of um, uh, arc, you know, to, to create a story arc. Um, and then, we're now going to segue from that to Three Identical Strangers, where Tim, um, we're sort of going, we're kind of catching her on up on the clips. I'm kind of trying to create artful segues to loop back around <laughs> through the clips as they are sequenced. So we're, we're getting slightly creative with our organization here, but I think it is interesting just as we think about constructing films, as we know, the challenge of, of constructing these different or, or approaching the different kinds of films that that are that you so spectacularly represent. And the challenge more of, yes, you have this extraordinary narrative, but you have much more, as, as, you, as you talk so wonderfully about creating that, the experience through the eyes of the brother and limiting it to their um, experience. And then how do you deal with the different sort of thematic and um, character and the sort of different, how did you sort of create the different sort of story beats and different sort of pockets of revelations along that experience arc? I, it, it was really hard. I mean, I think the hardest thing we had was that, it, it, that at one point the film shifts from being in the past tense to in the present tense and goes more observational. And those are, you know, they, they're completely different styles of, of filmmaking. They, they cut completely differently. The past tense stuff you can cut much tighter and much more like a kind of, you know, like a, almost like a Hollywood movie if you want, uh, or like a, a, dr a drama, whereas the actuality always plays slightly looser. There's always a bit more fat on it. And, and that, that transition between the two was always a, a real challenge. And I think, uh, um, you know, there's a moment where the guys are in an interview and they get up and walk out of the interview. And that was very deliberate to kind of try and make the uh, interview space, the verite space into, in, 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 make sorry, make the interview into a verite kind of, Try to help that transition. It's kind of a decompression um, space between the two, the two bits of the film. Um, but it was also hard because the stuff in the present tense. It was like an ongoing, like a proper investigation. Like we didn't, we had no idea where it was going to go. And raising funding, particularly in the UK, actually, people just kept saying, "Well, what's the third act? Where does it go? What are you going to? Who's going to talk to you? How? You know, how's it going to end? You know, we had no idea that we were going to get. There's a, you know, at the heart of the film. Big mistake. A, was that fun? Uh, is in retro no, I mean, uh, has it been satisfying doing so well? I do. Struggle? I do occasionally look at some of the rejections we let as we got and sort of grin a bit. And someone said, uh, "Yeah, we can't see where it's going, and I don't think it's very commercial." That was a major UK <laughs> funder, and I sort of—it's so tempting to kind of, you know, reply something about the film with, anyway. But you, you kind of, you know, rise above it. I just it. like dwelling on these stories because we all we all have these experiences with films where we can't. And and many maybe some of you are, are in the middle of it right now, where it's a, it is a struggle to convince oh, people no, of your vision. My favorite, and it's so fun looking at you all at the finish line, yeah, and going, look, you know. No, my my, my favorite one is that a, a small, a relatively small funder in the UK actually kind of quite a long way through the edit 
um, just didn't like. They said we just don't think it's very good. We don't like it, and they took their name off it. <laughs> and uh, but I still Big have mistake. to. I, yeah, contractually, I have to email them updates. So I like just send them these <laughs> updates, going, uh, it just got nominated for a BAFTA or whatever, <laughs> and they they just don't reply. So <laughs> And I, I'm always fascinated with, I get so confused because I am uh, I go both ways with British and American. And I, 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 does actuality, is that an American term? Is that a British term? No, see, that's is the UK one I Brits? use. That it throws people. They, yeah, us, like, that's a, we know that because it's UK, but what's the US term for actuality? Manifestation. <laughs> would you say observational? Would you, would you say actuality? Uh, I, I think they use it a lot in the UK, though. I think they sort yeah. of, they it, like it. It covers a, a multitude of sins in the UK. Actuality is kind of, you know. Yeah. It's just a slightly different uh, linguistics. I enjoy it. Um, uh, Michael Apter talking about British Americans, and I had a lovely conversation earlier about a, a lovely question is um, to appropriate a quote from the amazing um, Albert Maisels talking about um, how if you um, uh, made the film you set out to make, you're not doing it wrong. You, you haven't been listening. And uh, I would love to, for you to reflect on that. That, I 100% I believe that. I mean, that's the, never a truer word was spoken about documentary. I, I, I think I think it's important to go in with a plan and to have, like... Because if you go in... And I have worked on kind of verite films where I've just been, like, shooting everything that moves and then you try and cobble it together in the edit. And I think the further I've got into my career, the more I realise like, having a plan when you go in is really important, but also being flexible and, like, you know... Um, letting people lead you in ways that you didn't expect. You have to be open to that. If you're just expecting, particularly an interview, people just to, t you know, you're just ticking off a li list of questions, it will it will just feel dead and inert. And, you know, one of the things with Three Identical Strangers, I think, one of the reasons it works is because the guys were emotionally honest. It wasn't, you, you can have, like, narrative fidelity is really important, and it's important to be at factually accurate. Of course it is. But what you're actually looking for, or what I'm looking for, is emotional honesty. And that you know, it was a huge struggle to get the guys to sit down for an interview. I mean, it took, I literally, I got engaged, married, and had a child in the space of time. It took me to convince <laughs> them just to sit down and, and, to, and take part in the film. And, um, but when they did, they just, they were prepared to go to those places and, 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 you know, tap back into the emotions they felt at the time, from joy to kind of horror to disgust to everything that happened. And, and that's what elevated the film. And I think when you've got people who are, who are willing to go there emotionally, you have to be open in the interview. You can't just be like, here's a tick box of narrative beats I'm trying to get through, because you'll miss all the good stuff. Talking about good stuff, um, let's watch some, shall we? <laughs> I was going to do a silly segue to those two, to you two. How do you work as a team? <laughs> that was my, that was my, going to be my segue. <laughs> <laughs> you, James isn't buying it. No, I'm buying it. It's, yeah. it's always interesting well, I when there's. I feel like we don't have quite as romantic a story as, as Ty <laughs> and Jimmy do. <laughs> and then in the middle of the production, we left our husbands. And, uh, but, uh, but, um, or Sometimes the they wondered. I don't um, think he's here, but. <laughs> um, you know, we actually started out this project really not knowing each other uh, too, too well. Um, and over the course, so, you know, that was four years ago. And. Um, and you're still talking. And, and now we do awesome. know each other yeah, really well. We're not quite as, as, as in sync as the, uh, the identical strangers were, but... Um. Yeah, I mean, we have, it turns out, and, and I think we knew this instinctually, I mean, we had worked together a little bit on a project about the modern women's movement, and I think we have a similar sensibility, and we liked each other, but as Julie later confessed, she said, well, you know, I don't really know... Betsy, that well, so if it doesn't work out, it doesn't really matter. You know, if I lose her as a friend, it's okay. I have other really good friends. So. Well, it worked out. Betsy and Julie made a great team and a great film. Let's take a look at a scene from uh, RBG. Notorious RBG, yes. Um, uh, so I wanted to ask you two the same question about... Um, listening to your subject and, and the sort of discovery process or the surprises? Yeah, I, I agree totally with Tim that you have to be disciplined about and you have to have a plan for the film going into it and, and um, 
to be strategic about what it is you're going to get, but you never know how it's going to come out. And I, I think of the editing process, it's like a puzzle. You know, it's like doing a fantastic, really fun puzzle and moving the pieces around and trying to, to make something that expresses what you've come to learn, you know, in the course of doing it. So, you know, that, that's just my thought on it. We could easily have spent 90 minutes, at least, with each one of you talking about each one of these films, and it just, it just feels like short shrift, almost, to have only been able to talk to each of you for, for a few minutes. The good news is we have a reception afterward, and all of our filmmakers will be here, so I'm sure there are some questions from the audience, and our filmmakers will be here, and you can talk to them one-on-one -on -one and, and do those questions, but uh, for now, uh, but I will say, what a fantastic year for documentaries. One, one more time. Also, by the way, watch out, because I was just at Sundance, and there's a really other good year coming yeah. our Yay. way. But I want to take some time as well to really celebrate each and every one of you and to say how thrilled I am that... Um, <laughs> so with the Directors Guild, that we really try to really think about the craft of directing and how fabulous it is to listen to all of you really talk about your... Wonderful, wonderful um, work um, so candidly amongst our terrific peers. And I just want to applaud all the um, sort of personal joy that I feel that each of you is really contributing so much um, to, to this perception in the world that documentaries are where it is at, ladies and gentlemen. And so thank, thank you, you for coming and supporting the uh, thank you. nominees. We'll see you outside. To cinema, to cinema.